Pincushion sea stars inflate themselves with water to become round. Hi friends, what's going on? My name is Brandon and welcome to Nature Meets Paper, the place where we go on an adventure to discover the world of marine biology. I love sharing my experiences with aquatic animals with you through science, stories, and art. It's my goal to raise awareness of our beautiful bodies of water and the creatures that live in them. Today we're going to be discovering the tropical reef waters of the Pin Cushion Sea Star, or Cushion Star for short. Are you ready? Let's dive in! Before we get started, I want to let you know that there's very little research or helpful data that I could find about this animal. So little, in fact, that I was worried about filling out a fun adventure for you. I will do my best to keep this fun and engaging, though. Okay, Colcita Nova Guineae, I think that's right, also known as the Pincushion Sea Star or Cushion Star, is a tropical reef-associated sea star found from Madagascar, Seychelles, New Guinea, where it gets its name, Philippines, Australia, and Hawaii. They prefer coral reef habitat between 3 and 90 meters, or 9.8 and 295 feet deep. They spend their time on and near the coral reef. The reef offers them protection and a good place to climb. Let's go over my painting process. First, I take a reference photo of the animal. These photos are usually not the greatest or most beautiful photos. They are quick, composed poorly, weird lighting, and so on. I am not a National Geographic photographer by any means. I know enough about photography to get by, I just need proportions, color, and a feeling. I take that reference photo and then create a composition for my paintings. This painting is tiny, it's only 8 by 10 inches on canvas board. And I know that I said that I wanted to create larger, more dramatic, and moving paintings in the future, but I doubt anyone wants a painting of a pin cushion sea star large on their walls. So first I need to place my subject and focus. I calculate the golden ratio by taking the measurements of the canvas and multiplying them by 0 0.618. This allows me to measure where the focal lines of the canvas are. Then I can place my subject on those lines. I use tracing paper to create a composition to scale, then use transfer paper to put it onto the canvas. This makes it easier to erase when I make a mistake or want to change something around. Erasing on canvas is difficult and messy. Once the drawing is on the canvas, I tone the canvas using raw sienna. Well, in this case, raw sienna. A tone is a mixture of water and acrylic. It helps me to mix better colors. Painting on white canvas blows out the exposure and causes me to mix darker than I want. I want these colors to be vibrant and striking. I use Liquitex Basics when painting. They aren't a sponsor, but it's just a, a product that I use. I like how the paint can layer on itself, giving a depth to the painting. This, this means that most of the paint has some transparency to it. I typically work my paintings in three steps. In this one, I do something a little bit differently, and you'll just see as the adventure continues. The phases that I use are called blocking in, modeling, and detail phase. I like keeping my painting process easy to replicate. I like most of my life this way. It keeps it scientific and repeatable. Strangely, it also frees me up to be more creative. It means I have a general skeleton of how I create things, then I fill in the rest of the details with, of my life in, with interesting shapes, ideas, and colors. Let's get back into painting techniques that I use. Blocking in is loose with large dagger or flat brushes. This helps me to get a base coat and blocks in certain colors and shapes. During modeling, I use smaller brushes to add texture and refine the blocking. I find it helps to use mixing white during this and blocking in phase. Mixing white keeps the color mixing toned down. It allows the saturation to remain while mixing my colors. 
During the modeling phase, I create midtones and set my darks. This allows me to create the shadows and average colors of my painting. Then in my detail phase, I use titanium white to mix my brightest highlights. I use my smallest brushes and take a lot of time looking at my reference photo. This is where all the little details get added and push the painting towards the realism side of painting. While working at Wine & Design, I have noticed a majority of people want to stop their painting at the modeling phase. I don't know why. So I push people out of their comfort zones to finish the, li the little details and the highlights. This step does take time, but it also is when the painting comes together. I do know that getting through the modeling phase is hard. If I finished my paintings halfway through, they would not look as good either. That is why the detail phase is so important. It brings out the little details and pushes the highlights adding depth to the painting. Through teaching and coaching at the pool, I have also seen that some of us are hard on ourselves. In America, we are taught that failure is bad and should be avoided. But failure is a great teacher. You need to fail and make mistakes several times to learn to be better. When we do make a mistake, we beat ourselves up. Life is hard as it is, so don't make it even harder by making yourself the, your own enemy. Keep your head high and keep on pushing through. If no one kept playing Super Mario Brothers after the first, second, or tenth time of losing a life or game over, no one would ever complete the game. All right, so I got sidetracked and got all deep with you there. Let's head back into our adventure with the Cushion Star. Let's discover physical features and behavior of the Cushion Star. What are we looking for? That is a harder answer than I was hoping for. At one time, the same species throughout the world was thought to be over 10 species. That is because there are countless forms, colors, and life stages of this animal. So what can we expect? The color range is from fawn, brown, orange, yellow, and green. They typically have mottled spots and the tips of their arms are brighter than the rest of the body. They grow to be around 30 or 40 centimeters in diameter or 11.8 to 15.7 inches. Since it is a sea star, it has pentagonal radial symmetry with five stubby arms around the disc. The central disc is where the nerve ring is located. This is the location where all sensory info is collected and analyzed. In the middle of the nerve ring is where the stomach, water pumps, and other organs are located. The pincushion star is unique to other sea stars by its arms and body morphology. As juveniles, the cushion star is like most other sea stars. It is flat with stubby arms and webbing between the arms. It looks like a cookie cutout of a star shape. As the sea star ages, the edges of the disc, uh, the body disc, extend outward to the tips of the arms. This turns the sea star into a sea pentagon. The body is still flat during this phase of life. Then something odd happens. The disc pushes past the arms and rounds the pentagon into a rounded pentagon-like cushion. So think something that you would find on a hard chair filled with fluff. But that isn't the last of it. Once the disc is past the arms and it is round as it can go, the body starts filling with water to inflate like a balloon. They literally turn into living water balloons. I don't know how this affects their mobility. I imagine it would make moving around the coral reef difficult. The top of the sea star is covered in tiny ossicles and little spines all over its body. These are tiny spines that move and pivot in place to move. Much like a sea urchin, they move their spines to feel their surroundings. Underneath, they maintain their pentagonal symmetry. They have grooves running from the arms to the mouth. 
The bottom is covered in water manipulated tube, tube feet. So each tube foot is like a little suction cup that can sense and change its shape and grab onto things. If it has prey in its grasp, it moves it to the grooves on its arms that gets pushed to the mouth. Then feeding gets weird. Instead of sticking the prey in its mouth to digest and send to the stomach, the stomach comes out of the body and wraps itself around the prey. This allows the sea star to feed on things that are bigger than, itse than itself, which is pretty cool. As far as cool behavior goes, there isn't a ton of facts of on cushion stars doing cool things like flips and cool tricks. They do associate with species of shrimp though. They stick the shrimp underneath their body and protect the shrimp from danger. Sometimes it looks like the shrimps are carrying the sea star, but they could just be there to keep the sea star clean. Then there's a small scaleless fish that lives in association with sea stars and sea cucumbers known as the star pearlfish. This fish finds a way to live inside the sea star. Like the cushion star is its big snow globe and it's in the snowman. I kid you not, there is a fish that spends its time inside the sea star, in the dark, all alone, like Batman. Then at night, it emerges to feed. What? That is the most ridiculous thing I've ever read. For one thing, that is gross. For a second thing, why? Why would you want to live in a sea star? Oh, who lives in a sea star under the sea? Apparently the star pearlfish? I don't get freaked out by biology too often, but ugh, that is just crazy. All right, happy thoughts, not scary. Happy thoughts, not scary. What can I think of? All right, fun facts. Sea stars have ocular organs on the tips of their arms. So they can see on the ends of their arms. They also have regenerative properties. If the disc is intact, a part of the disc is intact of the sea star can heal and regrow limbs. Even cooler is that a new sea star can form from a single arm with a central disc part a portion that is still intact. That means you can cut a sea star in half and get two identical individuals from one. Now I don't recommend cutting sea stars in half, that's rude. They also reproduce with other sea stars to make tiny sea stars. What a cool animal. All right, let's go to our next segment. What do cushion stars eat and how are they doing? Pin cushion stars eat detritus and dead matter and small invertebrates including coral polyps. They are cleaners of the ocean. Unfortunately, if populations get too high, they have a negative impact on the coral but they do a good job of being in balance in their ecosystems. So how are they doing? The IUCN red list has them listed as unlisted. To be fair, the range of the sea star is humongous. Doing a population report on this species is difficult. I imagine they are doing fine in the wild. And good news to us. I read a funny fact that they have no negative impact on humans and that they are harmless. <laughs> that is great news. For every scary thing in the ocean, remember there are many more animals that are not so scary. Out of all the data that I found, or didn't find, this piece made me laugh. Okay, let's move to our final segment of the adventure. What was my personal encounter with this pin cushion star? The Maui Ocean Center has a touch tank for kids and kids at heart. The rule of thumb for touching sea creatures is the two finger rule. Touch with only two fingers. Don't grab or pick up the sea creatures. Also use the same pressure that you would use when touching your own eyelids. I always love giving sea urchins, sea cucumbers, and sea stars pets. I hope they like it. It feels fun. I know that the oils on our skin will not harm these animals. Certain animals don't do well if touched. 
but these are fine. Okay, this adventure has been in the making for four years. Let me explain. Sea stars like being protected and hide in rocks and corals, which means that they photo which means that they photograph terribly. For four years, I have taken photos of pincushion stars. They have all been too dark, not straight on, or just terrible photos that I throw out. Until last year. I got a sea star in the sunlight on some sand. This was my moment. I always loved the look of these creatures. I thought that they would make a great animal to study and share for you. I didn't know that there would be little research done. I just liked the colors and the shapes of it. This one might be a young adult. It is not fully puffed up, but had the fun cushion effect starting. It was also bright orange and yellow on the ends of the arms. I love the texture so much. The texture of the sand, the texture on the sea star, I knew I had to paint this one differently. So I took my time and painted every dot, every grain of sand, every bump, every cluster of ossicles on the sea star. Then I finished the painting with glass bead gel medium. This gives the painting a texture and plays with light. I wanted this painting to feel like you stuck your face in the ocean and saw a cushion star in the shallows of the reef. I know that it isn't the most extravagant painting that I have done, but I like it. The sunlight bouncing off the back, creating bright, vibrant colors in a playful and silly way. A painting perfect for the pincushion sea star. There we have it. This painting is finished. What do you think? I think I need to give my arm a rest. That was a lot of dots. I wanted to make sure that I got all the textures of the sand and of the sea stars just right, so I took extra time to place everything where it needed to be. If I earned it, please consider subscribing and liking this video. I also like to hear your comments down below. It really helps this community grow. Since it's April, I am going to be supporting ALS Research at als.org. I will leave a link down below. So, so if you have been around the community for a while, you know that in April I lost one of my close friends to ALS, and this just kind of affected me f ever since, you know, so I wanted to honor her and remember her every single uh, April by donating to Research for ALS. Now it's ALS is a um, neurodegenerative disease where uh, your body function slowly decays, or sometimes not so slowly decays, until you're no longer with us. Um, and it's just, it's a really sad disease and it affects a lot of people. And so by donating um, either time or funds or whatever you have, um, it's going into research for cures, it's going into resources for the families that are being affected by this. It's a wonderful organization and I will leave links down below so that you can go help as well. Thank you so much for watching. Spread love, curiosity, and creativity. God bless. I will see you in our next adventure.